Hello everybody, Jordan here at the PH is Silent. Let's talk about D&D. Let's talk about the races of D&D. After going into such depth with the elves, I wanted to explain the origins of the other major races of Turil. So we'll start with the dwarves and end with a more focused look at some of the human empires. So dwarves first appeared around the same time as the elves. Many non-dwarves believe that dwarves are not native to Trill and that they migrated here much like elves from another plane. But dwarves believe that their ancestors came from the earth itself, that the god Moradin forged them out of the planet and eventually they found their way to the surface world. While elves were fighting one another during the Crown Wars, the dwarves carved out numerous kingdoms. Now, after the Crown Wars, the, the drow who were banished to the Underdark, they attacked a large dwarven settlement in the Underdark, the largest dwarf settlement, um, and it fell to the drow, and those dwarves were scattered across Faerun. Their descendants would eventually become known as the Gold Dwarves, although many of them also made their way to Cholt and became known as Wild Dwarves. Other dwarves, specifically the clan Duragar, were captured by Illithids, and over the ages they were twisted and distorted from their former selves, and these Duragar could no longer really be called dwarves anymore. So they are now called Duragar, and they live solely in the Underdark. Gnomes. Gnomes originated as gems deep in the earth, and the gnome god Garl Glittergold brought them up, brought these gems up, and exposed them to air, breathing life into them, and thus creating the first gnomes. And legend says that certain gems affected the type of gnome that was created. So diamonds became rock gnomes, emeralds became forest gnomes, and rubies became deep gnomes. Humans and kobolds enslaved gnomes for much of their early history. They really had no homeland, no forged kingdoms throughout the Forgotten Realms history. They were kind of known as the scattered race or forgotten folk, and they rarely got swept up into grand events. Halflings appeared around the same time as dwarves. Uh, their exact origin is unknown, but it is believed that they came somewhere south of the Shar. They had a few homelands and settlements, but no really great big nations. Their races were typically nomadic, so a large kingdom just kind of didn't fit halfling style. Their deity that watches over them, though, uh, Yandala, she is credited as the creator of the halfling race. And interestingly enough, um, Yandala is an aspect of Chantia, who created most of the life on a beer to rail. So perhaps this reflection of Chantia created the reflections of humans, which became halflings. But now that I say that, I'm just kind of making up mythology, so that's not canon. It's not canon, but it's still fun to think about. Tieflings. Tieflings are humans who were touched, infused, or bred with outsiders of the Fiendish Plains. They are in a category of humans called plain touched. This phrase is used to describe any mortal creature whose lineage trace backs to celestials, fiends, elementals, etc. But tieflings specifically are those plain touched by devils and demons. So do you have a demon as a great-great-grandfather? You're probably a tiefling. There isn't much to say origin-wise. There wasn't a first tiefling that I could find. I imagine as long as there have been humans and outsiders, there have been tieflings. Dragonborn. Now the Dragonborn didn't arrive to the Forgotten Realms until 4th edition. They are native to Abir, the other part of the world given to the Primordials by Eo, the Overgod. Now, during the Spell Plague, which happened in 4th edition, and we'll talk about that when we get to the Spell Plague, um, a Dragonborn nation was transported from Abir to Turil, and, and with it, it brought the Dragonborn. Their exact origin is unknown, but, the, but here are the major theories. The Dragon God Io created them as servants for the first dragons. Bahamut created them in his image... Or, when Io was split down the middle and formed Bahamut and Tiamat, the dragonborn arose from the blood of Io that was spilled on the ground. And I have to do a timeout here. So, in an earlier video, I was confused as to the origins of dragons because I read that Asgorath created them, but I also thought it was Io before splitting him in two. Well, I learned today while researching this that they are the same god. Io and Asgorath are the same deity. I don't know why they have separate names or if this was just retconned somewhere to be the same deity, but he apparently just goes by two names. Orcs. Now, interestingly enough, orcs are not native to Turil. The creator race needed slaves and an army opening portals to the orc home plane, and they brought thousands over. And these orcs spread across Faerun, and these orcs became known as mountain orcs, specifically. Later on, humans opened a similar portal and brought over gray orcs. The orcs battled the elves before the Crown Wars. The orc god Grumish fought against the elven god Corallon, and Corallon won the fight by plucking out Grumish's eye, and since then the orc deity has been known as Grumish the One-Eyed God.
goblins. Now, I was really surprised. I could not find much information about the origins of goblins. I, I've been reading a lot of, of scattered books about D&D, um, both from AD&D and the 3.5 kind of era, where they had a lot of like history and mythology books printed. Um, but one piece of delving reveals that the hobgoblins might have created goblins as scouts. So hobgoblins apparently are, they're also goblinoids, so they're part of the goblin family. And they were really good at breeding various creatures into slaves. Like they, they bred a lot of wolves into, into slaves and, and other creatures. Um, but then I couldn't find any information about where the hobgoblins came from. So question mark? Humans. Now, humans have always been part of Tyrell. They're just native to it. And they started as ape-like tribes. Now, after the fifth crown war ended, Faerun just kind of settled a bit. There was no looming giant or dragon threats anymore, the drow went underground, and the elves stopped fighting. This was a prime time for humans to create some settlements. Most humans formed tribes or, or some small cities, or they lived with elves and dwarves in their cities. Now, some of the human sub-races across Faerun include the Kalashite, the Connathlan, the Damaran, the Aleskin, the Milan, and the Rashimi. Now, there were some humans that dramatically shaped Faerun, and because they're the most interesting to talk about, we're going to talk about them. The Emiskari, for example, they settled the fertile basin of the Ruani Plateau. The Emiskari started as farmers, but over the course of a thousand years became masters of magic and created a vast conquering civilization. They expanded their knowledge of transdimensional magic and were the first to create a permanent extra-dimensional space. Now, expanding on that, the Emiskari created a sprawling network of portals across southeastern Faerun. Emiskari civilization was unique at this time because it was ruled by wizards instead of kings. Powerful wizards would declare themselves Lord Artificer and rule over the lower citizens. The kingdom of Emiskar uh, started around 8,000, negative 8,000, and grew till about negative 4,000 DR. Uh, and with that time, a suspicious plague decimated their cities. And now after the plague, to quickly rebuild their empire, the wizard rulers opened portals to faraway worlds and brought in hundreds of thousands of human slaves. And these prisoners brought their faith with them to the new world. The wizards of Amaskar, in an attempt to isolate the slaves from their gods, closed all of the portals to the slave homelands, and they put up a magical barrier that prevented divine intervention. Now this jumble of cultures and people soon amalgamated into the sub-race of Milan, or the, the sub-race of humans, Milan. Despite the divine barrier, the Milan's prayers for salvation did not go unheard, and eventually their gods, who were Egyptian deities, by the way, like Ra, Set, Horus, um, they were informed by Eo that their people needed help. The gods requested access to the crystal sphere where Tyrell was located. Now, a crystal sphere is a spelljammer phrase. Um, it's like a, a pocket universe um, is encompassed in a crystal, crystal sphere. Really, you can think about it as like other dimensions, I guess. But for Spelljammer, you would traverse Crystal Sphere to Crystal Sphere and go to these other worlds. Lord Ao granted access to these gods, but only allowed the gods to send their power through a chosen human in the form of an avatar. So the Milan gods uh, chose two people to become physical manifestations of a god on Tyrell. These avatars started a rebellion against the Emascari. These manifestations, or these avatars, they joined the fight against the Mascari artificers, and the cities were just engulfed in flames. Many of the greatest wizard lords battled to their very last breath, and the current lord artificer fell in an epic battle with the avatar of Horus, and eventually the Milan destroyed the wizard kings. They won their freedom. After that, the Milan spread across Tyrell and settled much of southern Faerun and controlled the eastern shores of the Sea of Fallen Stars. The Emiskari didn't go away completely. During the uprising, a powerful wizard ruler named Ilfemenon escaped to the Underdark with a small number of his followers. And there he created a kingdom called Deep Emiskar. And his descendants ruled that place for many centuries as kings and queens. Also, something brief but interesting, um, during this time as well, the dwarves waged a war against the giants, and it was aptly called the Giant Wars, and they decimated them. I mean, more than 5,000 giants of Nedenheim, an ancient kingdom of stone giants, they fell to the dwarves, and by the worst conclusion, more than half of the entire giant population south of the Cloud Peaks was exterminated, 
and that stone giant kingdom, uh, Nedenheim, was reduced to just scattered clan holds. And that's where we'll end it today. Tune in next week when we talk about the rise and fall of the Netherese, an empire fueled by magic. Please like and subscribe, every little bit helps, and share this video with a friend if you find it interesting. And always, thank you for watching.